Ich Gott heisst Michael, ein Masterstudent von Yeshiva University. Denn für 20 Jahre war er als Army Chaplain, including as well in Korea und in Germany. Now, thank God he lives here, his wife is on our committee, and I'm delighted to say that his mother is here as well. So, Rabbi Itzkowitz, please. start talking usually by asking a question. Those who are sleeping would wake up immediately and they would try to answer. But the question is, where in the first word of the Parsha do we have the idea of Emunah? No, no. Midrashim, you have to think of Rashi. <coughs> Anybody? What's the first word? Vayishma. Vayishma Yitro. What does Rashi say there? You heard the... What did he hear that caused him to come? He left Midian, the comfort. He was the high priest of Midian, and he comes to the Midbar, to the, to the wilderness, to see the Jewish people. His son-in-law, of course, grandchildren. But what did he hear that led him to come? So this is Machloket. The Rashi doesn't bring the whole Midrash, but Rabbi Yeshua briefly says, Milchemet Amalek Shama Uba. He heard the war of Amalek and how the Israelites fresh nation of slaves coming out of Egypt defeated the Amalekites. Rabbi Elazar Amodai says, Matan Torah Shema Uva. He heard Matan Torah. That's already a machloket if he came before or after, but according to this uh, Midrash. And Rabbi Eliezer says that he heard Kriyat Yamsuf. Now, Kriyat Yamsuf was first, of course, and then was Amalek, and then Matan Torah. So the question arises after hearing about Kriyat Yamsuf, what does he have to hear about Amalek? What's, what's so special about hearing Amalek that he has to come after that? No, nope, here we have the idea of Emunah. Because Amalek Begimatria is what? I like Gimatria. It's the same as There we are, okay. Catching on. Safek. Safek. Doubt. Doubt. Now, this was a war he heard about where they were attacking Hashem. Milchamal Hashem ba'amaleka. They were attacking, they wanted to cool off the zeal of the Jewish people, of the Israelites, and to show that eh, they're not so hot after Hashem after all, and they wanted to cool them off. So they wanted to bring their bitachon, their emunah down. Well, Baruch Hashem, we have emunah today. We won against Amalek, and we have this great group of women who work so hard to do so much good. I'll elaborate in a couple of minutes on that. But, you see, it was a victory for Emunah. And indeed, you picked a good name for your organization, not you, maybe whoever picked it. Uh, coming to the Ten Commandments, the Seret HaDibrot. I can't gloss over the, the uh, fifth one, or the fourth one I'd like to say something about, but I, I have to say something about the fifth, because my mother is here. And all that. Uh, we, have, we hope that Hashem gives her many more good years of life, her uh, devoted uh, assistant here, Julianne, who has uh, been hired a few months ago to help her. And uh, we hope both of the, the shidduch works for many, many years to come. And uh, that in that sfut we'll be able to also be many years on our land and in peace, in fact, on our land. So that was one of the commandments. Another commandment I'd like to elaborate on a little bit is Zachor et Yom HaShabbat Likarsho, sanctify the Shabbos. You know that it's repeated again in Dvarim, but with a different word. How does it start there? Shamor. 
What's the difference between Zachor and Shamor? Okay, the mitzvot ase, mitzvot lot ase, right? The mekudosh, shonik Shabbos, all the good things uh, that we enjoy on Shabbos, get a rest on Shabbos, right? Sheina b'shabbat tanug, the abbreviation of Shabbos, shin bet taf, sheina b'shabbat tanug, it's a joy to have a rest on Shabbos. And all those good things are especially loved by whom? By those who can afford it, the ashirim, people who can afford to eat special food, Basar, Dagim, Chomat, Amim, all the delicious things for Shabbos. So, some of you might be wondering about the cards here. It says bed. Not, not, that, I'm, not that I'm tired or anything yet. I, I did rest today. And the other one says summer. We hope for beautiful weather, but we need the rain as well. These are cards that my wife uh, discarded. And Baltashka to show them away after she was teaching English, you know. She went to some more modern things. And uh, I, I use them for my notes. All right. Anyway, so Zachor is especially beloved by the Ashirim, the people who can afford it. Shamor, on the other hand, is very easy to do. You, you don't do anything, right? You kind of take it easy on Shabbos. You, you sit back. You don't have to uh, buy all the things. You're observing the negative commandments. Sheva al So that is Shamor. It's very difficult, though, to switch roles. For the rich people to give up their parnasa did not work one day a week, as you know, many, many years ago, uh, especially in the Western countries in America, which I know, grandparents, grandparents, grandparents who came there, if they didn't work on Shabbos, uh, it was very, very difficult. So it was a great, great sacrifice for the for people to close their businesses, to tell their people, their workers to take off, and so on. Uh, they wanted to, you know, uh, make the greenback, make money. So it's very difficult for the Ashirim maybe to keep the Shamor, and it's, on the other hand, very difficult for Aniyim, the poor people, to properly enjoy the Shabbos with all the good things that you're supposed to have. And so Emuna, the group here, remember both. They observe the Torah without compromise. Not only that, but they remember those who cannot afford perhaps childcare, chinuch, and they sacrifice for that. So this, again, is a, a very good thing about this organization. We have to be makir tov. We have to, to always appreciate and thank not only Hashem for the beautiful rains that we've had this year and the snow that we had this year, but the gashmiyut, of course, geshem is related to gashmiyut. Im ein kemach ein Torah. It's a very short story I'd like to say the, about Chavetz Chaim and then one other one will be concluding. Chavetz Chaim once had a Gaon, a great Torah scholar, come to his house, and he was talking and talking. He was giving Torah to the Chavetz Chaim, talking and talking, you know, chidushim and all kinds of stuff, you know, to impress the Chavetz Chaim or just to sit and learn, get the mitzvah of learning, whatever. I'm not saying why he did it, but uh, the Chavetz Chaim, after a few hours of this, put his hand on his stomach and he said in Yiddish, "The Behema Levil Essen," the part of him which is the Bahami. The part animal needs to eat something. In other words, even he admitted, "Amen kemach in Torah." You got sometimes you got to eat something, and this is a beautiful, beautiful dinner that we're having here, and I hope it gives us a lot of strength to eat Torah and a lot for the organization. I'd like to close though another pasuk from the parsha that we have to say here because these women work so hard. If it weren't for the women, what would be with us, with the husbands, with the sons, the fathers? The very famous pasuk, right? <clears throat> In this week's parsha, tell the women Beit Yaakov. Rashi says Elu Hanashim, and then after that the Tagid Livne Israel, and then then tell this Harim, the men. He says, why were the women mentioned first? There are many explanations to this, but I'd like to share an experience that Rabbi Meir Shapiro once had. He was on a fundraising tour. And he spoke in a shul, in a synagogue, trying to raise money for his great yeshiva, Chachmei Lublin. And he gave a terrific speech. He was a, an orator, he was a member of the SEM, you know, in Poland. He was a member of the parliament. And they say, I heard that whenever you gave him something from any part of the Shas, any part of the, and we learned Daf Yomi, thanks to him also, some of us here. Uh, he established that way back, 19, what was it, 1923 or something? Hmm? And uh, it's so, gone through so many cycles, learning a daf of Gemara a day. And he uh, was trying to raise funds. They say that if you would have told any part of the Mishnah or Talmud, would have mentioned it to him, he could tie it in with 
whatever you're learning today. Bring everything together. The whole Torah is one, he said. But anyway, he was trying to raise money, and he gave a terrific speech. And people clapped, and he said, you know, we used to sacrifice a lot in the past, especially mothers used to sacrifice. They used to send not only their children, but even their husbands used to leave home to go to yeshivas far away, and they had to work very hard and sacrifice property and, and time and uh, work and everything else. And he tried to point out, you know, how much in the past Jews sacrificed for, uh, for an old neighbor here, uh, sacrificed for chinuch, which Emunah is doing too. Well, at the end of that, people clapped, but nobody came forth. <laughs> nobody raised their hand to give a donation. Until one woman, her name happened to be Devorah, he found out later, stepped out of the women's section, came over, and started taking off her rings, her earrings, her bracelet, her necklace, she laid it on the table, all of her jewelry, and she said, I'm donating this. I don't have any money here, but this is it. <clears throat> Some women followed her and did the same. And then he was a little bit shocked, taken aback, didn't expect you know, the evening to go that way. So Rabbi Mayor Shapiro, <coughs> so it happens to be my mother's maiden name, Shapiro, too. I hope we were related somehow to Rabbi Mayor Shapiro. I haven't found it yet. Uh, he uh, said to her, he said, you know, this is a great thing that the women are doing. He said, but of course the husbands are going to be a little upset that their women don't have any jewelry. So I'm giving a chance to the husbands now to redeem their wives' jewelry. <laughs> and they, they indeed came forth, many of the men, you know, they didn't want to get hit on the head, those who didn't come, I guess, forth to, to redeem their wives' jewelry. And they did, and, and he was able to raise a lot of money thanks to that Devorah who came forth and the other ladies. Now, he closed his speech by saying, you know, he quoted this pasuk from this week's portion. First tell the women and then the men. He says, now I see why. He says, if, the, if God would have first offered the Torah to the men, it would have, been, would have been Ein Sof. We would have waited and waited. Nobody would have come forward. So it had to be the women first. Again, I'd like to bless all the women here and uh, in your work, the great work that you do. Uh, by the way, he said also that the Devorah, Devorah, the name Devorah, who was the famous Devorah? Eshet Lapidot. Eshet Lapidot. And he said, you know why it says that she was the wife of Lapidot? What do we have to know our husband's name for? Dora was a great prophetess. Ooh, her husband, what did he do? We don't see anything he did. Barak did. Barak bin Abinoam. Lapidot says, because he says, Devorah made petilot. Lapidot she made for the Mishkan. Devora, you probably heard this before. Midrash, uh, Rashi brings it right there on the spot in Sefer Shoftim. That Lapidot means that she made these Lapidot, these torches, these flames for the Beit HaMikdash. That was the big thing, and he said the women here also. They lit the fire so that the men would be able to come forth also and learn Torah. May Hashem bless you with the strength for many more, many more years until Mashiach comes, and indeed everybody will see the light of Torah and will be able to support each other. Thank you very much. Shavuot Tov, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me very great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Rabbi Dr. Aaron Adler. Rabbi Adler made Aliyah with his family in 1979. Rabbi Adler is a graduate of Yeshiva University, where he studied under the legendary Rav Yosef Be'er Soloveitchik. He received Samicha from there, and later a doctorate in Talmud from Barilan University. He is currently the Rav in Ohel Nechama Shul in Katamon, having previously served as Rav in the Veyarot Community Shul in Ramot, and later as visiting Rav in a shul in Zurich. His educational activities are many and varied. He served as Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshiva Bnei Akiva in Kashmanaim. He was a lecturer to the Israeli Defense Forces, 
and campus rabbi of the Amunah College for Arts in Yerushalayim. Rabbi Adler also gives a weekly share at the OU Israel Center and at the Sinai Kolel in Yeshurun Synagogue. In his spare time, Rabbi Adler has led over 20 missions to Poland, where I and several other people here tonight were privileged to accompany him. It was on that trip we really appreciated his vast knowledge of Hasidism and his love of Hasidic melody. In fact, he made a potentially difficult trip into a very meaningful experience. So, without further ado, I hand you over to Rabbi Abba. this occasion, I was asked to entertain and talk a little bit about Shlomo Kalbach, and we dedicated the entire evening to Rav Shlomo's music. Tonight, I was asked to do something a little different, to deal with Hasidic stories and song, the Hasidic experience. So, let's begin with a little song, and then we'll work on the, uh, the Hasidic Maiselach. <laughs> and their implications. We talk about Hasidut, it brings us back to the days of the Baal Shem Tov, 300 years ago approximately. And we know that what happened at that time was not the discovery of a new brand of Yiddishkeit, but rather the focus moved from a purely intellectual description and definition of what it meant closeness to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, connecting to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in a halachic sense, 
to a type of connecting to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, less so by the mind, more so by the heart. Our Rabbi Rav Soloveitchik pointed out once that the Musar movement of Lithuania of the 19th century, and we know some great names from Yisrael Salanta down to the present day, without Khalila saying a bad word about the personalities, the Rav said that the Musa movement was a fiasco. I'll explain to you what he meant by that. While the Hasidic movement in Poland was a smashing success. And you have to realize the Soloveitchik family were not Hasidim. These are thoroughbred misnagdim. Basically, when you talk about a movement and you want to know if it succeeded, the, um, the place, the avenue, the location that you're going to search, seek out to see if it succeeded, in terms of the masses, well, walk around Kalyusville. How many people are affected today on a day-to-day -day, you know, way, you know, day-to-day -day, uh, lifestyle by the Muslim movement? How many people are guided by the thinking, by the teachings of Musa. The Musa movement, in its classic sense, spoke very much about the fact that man was not really worth much, at least some brands of the Musa movement, and most people didn't want to hear that message. The Musa movement, to a large degree, spoke to an elitist group in Lithuania. And when you address an elitist group, you cannot expect that this is going to make it across the board <coughs> to call you so. In Poland, on the other hand, Ukraine and then Poland, there you had you know, a widespread type of Jews, but many, many simple Jews who were from Shomrei Torah Mitzvot, living in most difficult conditions. And they needed something to hang on to. This is coming after the aftermath of the the various uh, pogroms of the Gzerot HaFatat, the Chalmenichke pogroms, and the rise of all kinds of pseudo-Messianic movements, Shabtai Tzvi and others, Yaakov Frank. The movement was there to give people something to hang on to, that even the simplest person in the world has a chance to get close to Kadosh Baruch Hu. In the world of Lithuania, where, where success was measured by your greatness in Torah scholarship, in Poland, that was not the criteria at all. Not that they didn't have great Talmud HaChomen, they did have. They had great Tzadikim. When you talk about the masses, the masses connected to Kadosh Baruch Hu on a different wavelength. And what the Hasidim did, what the Admorim, the Rebbe's succeeded, was to have people connect through song. Now they didn't invent this either. Song takes us back to Beit HaMikdash. And that's part of Avodat Hashem. Ashir shall the VM or you are moving to Mikdash, no doubt. So there is an aspect of Shira and musical accompaniment in Beit Mikdash. And we also know that in the Middle Ages, even before the official Kabbalistic movement, in the 11th century, there was a movement called the Yodei Merkava, those who came down from the chariot. It's an interesting phrase based on Mase Merkava, which we read about just today in the Aftarah from Yeshayahu Perdvav. Yodei Merkava was a movement almost, let's call it a pre-Kabbalistic movement, and they were the ones who introduced into the Siddur what we say every single day at the end of Sukkot Zimra, by Baruch David. By Baruch David was not originally part of Sukkot Zimra. Sukkot Zimra ended with the end of Tilim. Kol HaNeshama Talel Yahaluyah, and that's why the Pesach said twice, because the end of the Sefer. And even Bo Hashem Lolam Amen Vamein, you can see it's an ending, it's an ending paragraph. The Rambam tells us that Shirat Hayam, Az Yashir, there was a minute to say it after Yishtabach, after, before Baruch Hu. Like the way we have, on a certain Mechuvah, we say Shara Malot Mimamakim, it's like caught in the web there, after Pesuket Zimra, before Baruch Hu. So some communities had the custom to say Shirat Hayam, Az Yashir, some had Hazinu, some, custom, some communities said both. But it was not part of Pesuket Zimra. It was already beyond Yishtabach. And anything beyond Yishtabach is outside. Today we say the Az Yashir before Yishtabach. We've brought it into the fold of Pesuket Zimra. But Pesuket Zimra technically ended with Kol HaNashamas Ta'alel Ya'alu Ya. It was the Yorday Merkava who introduced Vavarach David, L'cha Hashem HaGdula, Bagbura, Batiferet, Vanetzach, Vahod. These are Pesukim from the Re'ayimim, but they were the first to teach us the concept of the concentric circles of the Sfirot, of Chesed, Gvura, Tiferet, Netzach, Hod, Yesod, and Malchut. 
which later was adopted by the Lurianic uh, school of Kabbalah. And that's why it enters, because the idea was that we have to shift gears from one circle to the next, from one sphere to the next, in order to arrive at a Kadosh Baruch Hu. It does not happen in one jolt, in one launch. And the Erdei Merkava believed that it would be music that would serve as the shifting of the gears, if you may, the clutch of the car. You need something to shift gears, and music would be that which would be used as the medium to move us from Gvua to Tefere to Netzach to Hod and Malchut and so on. So music is not new. It was the Hasidic movement that very much incorporated this as a, as a very important aspect of Avodat Hashem. Uh, several years ago, I heard a, um, heard a shiv from our, our great rabbi Rav Aaron Lichtenstein, uh, from the Yeshiva Taratzion, Rosh Shiva, Rav Sanandor, most of you know him. And he quoted the Rav's uncle, Rav Aaron Salavechik, I'm sorry, the Rav's brother, Rav Aaron Salavechik, Zechoyen Levrocha from Chicago, who quoted the Balatanya, the founder of Chabad, of Shnei Zalman from Liadi, said there are three levels of Nigan. The lowest level, level of Nigan is a Nigan with words. A higher level of Nigan is a Nigan without words. I think we mortals can even understand that. There's something very spiritual just about the Nigan without the words. But the first Rebbe of Chabad goes on to say there's a higher level, and that's a Nigan without a Nigan. And this I didn't really understand. I went over to Rabbi Lichnesi and after the shir, and I said, I think I understand what this is. It's a Litvisha Nigan. <laughs> But in all sincerity, somebody heard this from me once and presented me with a book called The Ginal L'Or HaChasidut. And I finally began to understand, even in a small way, what this concept of Nigan L'Lo Nigun means. And that was the ability, and very few people would even have this, to make these transitions from Chesed to Gvura, Gvura to Tiferet, without the use of a medium. And that means it was really the highest level of nigun. So most mortals would require some type of medium of nigun to make the transition. But if somebody was already up in the highest spheres and could do it with automatic transmission, so that was already a nigun without a nigun, a very, very lofty idea, humor aside. And in this sefer, nigun niginal or chasidut, so it's specifically, it's a Lubavitch book, and it's explaining many, many facets of uh, nigun in the world of Chabad. But I'm just going to read a line. It says, Niginat nigunim chasidiim yichelik me'avodat Hashem. It's an integral part of avodat Hashem, the song itself. He's not talking about the words. So that the, the, the very, very structure of music, the sound of music, and, um, and, and how that impacts on the neshama, how it impacts on a person's vocal cords, his lips, his tongue, and all the bodily functions that are necessary to bring out the music all become sanctified because of the, uh, the music. And I can say again, I'm not going to read you the book, but it's, a, it's an entire exposition here of the role of music in Hasidic life. Now some of the Hasidic groups ultimately, we talk about the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov believed that in each generation there was one tzaddik, one tzaddik. And his role, fundamentally, was to allow the tefillah of Klal Yisrael to make it to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. What were the issues here? In Sefer Megillat Echa, that was authored by Yirmiyahu Navi, in the third parak, it reads, Satam Tfilati, the fact that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is, 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 was no longer evident and present amongst Klal Yisrael, what we call Hester Panim, at the time of the Horban, so Satan Tfilati, the, the, the road to Tfilah was, was blockaded. We, we, we can't pierce through this wall. So it's like you're davening to the wall, and you're not davening to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So the idea was that every generation has one Tzaddik who has this ability to somehow transcend the wall and bring the message of Tfilah to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So what we have to do is like with a telephone call, not direct dial, but an uh, uh, operator assistant call. Remember those? And uh, the Rebbe, would, the Admor, would serve as the operator 
And if you directed your tefillah through the tefillah of the Admor, then you had a fighting chance that your tefillah would also make it to Kisei HaKavod. You can hear a little bit why the, the Vilna Goin was so against the Hasidut. On this very, very point, by the way, the Vilna Goin did not tolerate it. The Vilna Goin said this sounds very foreign to Judaism and that each Jew, no matter what the circumstances, had the ability to daven. But nevertheless, this is pure Hasidut, and, and each generation would have one tzaddik. But the uh, Baal Shem Tov had a primary student, and he was Rav Dov Ber, the Magid from Ezrich, who he had many students. And from those many students, we now have differentiation. The Baal Shem Tov is not in Poland, he's in what modern-day Ukraine, in Mezrich. And then the Magid from Mezrich, that's still the Ukraine. But at that point, the third generation of Hasidut, you now have differentiation. Rav Shnei Zalman from Liadi is white Russia. It eventually moves to the town of Lubav, which becomes Lubavitch, by the third Admor of Chabad. Admor, Adunenu, Moreno, Varabenu, a Rebbe, a Tzaddik, all kinds of nicknames. But Hasidut moves to Poland by another great individual, student of the Magad from Mezrich, and he is Rebbe Melech from Lijansk. And we're going to see a few Maiselach from Rebbe Melech from Lijansk and see how special he was, because he becomes the father of Polish Hasidut. It takes a few generations. His prime student is the um, uh, the, the Choyze from Lublin, who has a prime student who's known as the Heilig Yid, and moves to the town of Psishcha, and from Psishcha it moves to Kotsk by Menachem Mendel of Kotsk, and Menachem Mendel from Kotsk has a prime student who is Reb Itchemeyer Alter, from, becomes the first Reb of Gur, and the rest is history. Just go to, uh, to Geula, and you'll see the Gera dynasty there. But from the Choyzeh from Lublin, it branches out to others. And we have a whole different uh, marketing of what the Hasidus is all about. So some of the Hasidic groups, for example, Gur, the emphasis on Talmud Torah was there. They, there are Gera and Nugunim, no doubt. I'll sing some tonight. But the emphasis of Ger was Talmud Torah, to sit and learn. In Chabad, it's somewhat of a mixture. There's a tremendous amount of learning going on in Chabad. The Dal the Rebbe, the Rabbi Azakain, the author of the Tanya, the Balatanya, Shnezam Liadi, all these names, one person. He he emphasized study. I mean, he puts together in one book, the Tanya, for the first time, a compilation of Kabbalistic thought that's appropriate for Balabatim, for simple people. Before then, who studied Hasidut? Hasidut was, well, who studied Kabbalah? It was, a, it was a small core of an inner circle of people who would deal, dabble with Kabbalah. Tanya made it a very, very popular subject. I'm not sure that Rav Shlem Zalman from Liadi had in mind that Madonna is going to study Tanya uh, or, or Kabbalah, but it has become very, very popular, as you know. But Chabad has Nigun also. So Nigun is not the first and foremost, but it's an ingredient in the Hasidut of Chabad. If we jump to Mojitz, I, I can tell you just recently I saw a vort from the Rebbe of Mojitz. But it was such a rare thing. Because when you say Mojitz, you think Nigun. You don't really think Advar Torah. You, you can have a Gera Nigun and you can have a lot of Torah from the uh, Svat Emet. You can have a Lubavitch Nigun, but you have a lot of Torah from all the Rebbes. You say Mojitz, you're going to sing Nigunim, and uh, that's where it is. In Poland, uh, when you go to the kever of the Mojitz Rebbe, you do nothing else but sing a Nigun, because that's how you're going to remember the Mojitz. Uh, and the Mojitz uh, had tremendous impact on the song of Hasidut of Poland. They used to compose new Nigunim every year before Rosh Hashanah Kippa and send out the kids to the various neighborhoods to teach them the new Nigunim. And it was an industry. Thanks to Benzi and Schenker, who in my uh, growing up days was an icon, because we had all the records of uh, Mojitz, and only two years ago at a wedding in New York City, I finally had a schut of meeting him. Adnei Metzrim, he was then 85 years old, he had a brach under the chuppah, and I went over to him, shake his hands, I said, I know you for so many years, and I never met you. But uh, this Benzi and Schenker, not only was a composer, but also a singer, he, he, he cut the records for Mojitz, and preserved so many of the beautiful, beautiful nagunim of Mojitz, like V'yitem Lecha and Hamavdil of Mojitz, and no different. Hey. 
thing when I was a little child. We had a great uncle, my grandfather's younger brother, who was about Tfila and the Shtibol that I've grown up. And he used to teach uh, my brother and I, myself, uh, the Gunim, before he would introduce them. And this Nigan came out in the late 1950s, this Mizbal Adovit. I remember sitting in a park bench in Washington Heights on a Friday, and our uncle was teaching us this Nigan. Because on Yom Tov, when it doesn't come out on Shabbat, and you don't sing Kel Adom, so, and you jump right away to the continuation of davening, so he wanted to sing anyway, by Kulam uh, Ahuvim, Kulam Berurim, Kulam Giborim, Kulam Kiddoshim. So I remember uh, one of my chaverim in the Yeshivat Pnei Akiva, the principal of the school, Rav Yoni Bolin, he told me, the way we treat all our kids, they're Kula Mahuvim and Kulam Kadoshim. The problem is Kulam Potrim at the end. <laughs> but this is said about the Malachim. And my uncle sat down with us, and it is Galatianisha Mifta. And it worked out nicely to sing the Kula Mahuvim. The whole, this is the first time I heard it, not even to the words of Ms. Maladovid. And, um, and it stuck with us till this very, very day. Moshitz. Now, we know, and we heard this from Shlomo Kalbach often enough, that he himself was influenced, tremendously influenced by Moshitz. Of course, Shlomo Lod developed his own uh, style, and I'm not here to do Shlomo Lod, but we do one Shlomo Lod, just as Matzah Shabbos anyway. So uh, how can we do go without it? <laughs> Oh, 
tolerate an island that doesn't sing with them. <laughs> Today there's an entire literature called Sipurim Hasidim, Hasidic stories. The famous uh, Rav Shlomo Yosef Zevin Zatzal, who was the editor of the Encyclopedia Talmudit, wrote a whole book of compilation of Hasidic stories. All you have to do is go to Rabbeinu Google on the computer. <laughs> He's from the G'daylem today, Rabbeinu Google. He's a bulky and everything. And just um, just ask to a search for Sipurim Chasidim, and you're going to get an uh, unbelievable amount of uh, information, source material. So I called just a few things that I thought might be of some interest. I, I'll translate. I know we're doing this in English tonight. But uh, if you just take a look at the pages that I handed out. If somebody did get a page, we still have some here. Uh, the last one on the first side, the, the last one, it says, Kriyat Shem L'Nolad. See it? Calling the name. All right, so there was a minag amongst the Hasidim that uh, they wouldn't uh, dare give a name to a baby without the Rebbe suggesting the name. Okay, any of you familiar with this minag? That the Hasidic Rebbe is the one who's going to call the shots? Whether the name, it's not that you took a name, of, uh, a candidate name to the Rebbe and asked if this was appropriate or not. You came with no name and the Rebbe was going to give a bracha. The baby wasn't even born yet. It's known. I mean, you have to really be a believer in the tzaddik. The wife is expecting. Already before the birth, already we'd like to have an inside track as to what the name of the baby is going to be. Later in American Hasidic life, there's a town called Square Town, or New Square. But this is back in the town of Square in Europe. Such a question came to the Square Rebbe. He used to respond as follows. If there's going to be a baby boy, the name would be this. If it's a boy, it's this. If it's a girl, it's that. Several times, I heard from the Rebbe himself, he only said one name. For example, Shem Zachar. He just, the, 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 the father, the expecting father, would ask the question, and the response was, if it's a boy, say whatever the name. Bardat, if the, the person who asked had some seichel, lo sha'al od me'uma, that boy, never had a follow-up question. He just accepted the fact that if the Rebbe is now giving one name, a boy's name, then clearly the wife is giving birth to a boy. 
and if the Rebbe gave a girl's name, the wife is giving birth to a girl. Omnam, however, Imayar Shoel Shoel Shalomidat, if the, the questioner was not such a smart fellow, and he asked this follow up question, and what's the deal if the wife gives birth to a girl? So then he gave a, a name for the girl as well. This happened to me several times. I heard the following story. The person told me, by the Rebbe, the Eitzaita Ishto Muber, his wife was expecting. Vishal Admor, Eza Shem Yikale Yelavlat Shishtale Dishto. It's the same question. Vamar Lo Shem Shazachar. The Rebbe gave him a boy's name. Vishal Hu Odladmor, Mayem Tele Nikibai, if the baby's a girl. Eza Shem Ekalo, what name could we suggest? Amar Lo Admor, Shem Shel Nikiva. He gave a girl's name. Vamar Isha now, the person said to the Rebbe, that's not a good idea. Ki imo korim ota b'shem ze shamar admor v'ye b'chayim chayita. No, rega, rega. The Rebbe said Leah, but this fellow's mother's name is Leah, and she's still alive, and that didn't sit well. That didn't sit well with the fellow, because there's even an implication that the mother is going to pass away before the baby's born, and he didn't like this answer. He tells the Rebbe, I'm sorry, I'm reject. Imagine a chosse telling the Rebbe, I can't accept this. Instead of changing the name for the girl birth, he says, well, then what's left is your wife's going to have a boy. <laughs> Worked that fine. And they had a boy. Exactly as the Admor said. After nine years, nine years after she had her last baby, all of a sudden, it's very miraculous, she gives birth to a daughter. She, a span of nine years passes. She's not having children anymore. At least she thinks she's not. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she's expecting, and she gives birth to a daughter. When the daughter was born, the mother died. As the Rebbe had suggested all along. Okay, what exactly are you going to do with this story and how that impacts on... Well, you don't have to do anything with it. Nothing, okay. Uh, the, this has to do, as the opening line said, you have to be a ma'aminim batzadikim. See, if you're a little bit of a skeptic, these stories are, are not for you. They're not for you. But I'm trying to just bring you a little bit into the world, into the world of Hasidot. And in the world. What? Emunah is in the world. Emunah is in the world, right. But it's a different emunah, right. Or, for example, the bottom of that second page, Hachanot Pesach. this brings us already to Rabbi Limelech from Lishansk. Echad mi chasidei Rabbi Rabbi Limelech one of his uh, chasidim dealt with, um, with, with the spirits and, and, and whiskeys. Yash is yayin saraf, saraf is, uh, is, uh, is whiskey. Before Pesach, the Pesach, my chasid mechin chavit gedola shal yash. Before Pesach, the chasid prepared a tremendous barrel of yash, of whiskey. Ota haya noheg lavriach il mavar meivah legvul ulumachra. I used to smuggle it to the other side of the border. And Marviach Vamearevach from the prophets, Hayakune Mechin and Kotzok Hechai Pesach. He made enough money on these deals to have his Pesach provisions. Otashana that year, Nasoa Chasid Vagalab Chaviti Yashalo, as usual, he traveled with his wagon, with his uh, barrel of Yash. Vetokshu Minasela Friach Etagvul, he's trying to uh, cross the border. Tafsuoto Shomreagvul, the guards caught him. Bechrimut Mitano Ayakar, and they confiscated his uh, merchandise. And here, this man is in bad shape, bad financial shape. All his money is invested in this one barrel. If he does not succeed to sell this barrel of yash, he is going to be penniless. We are going to have provisions for Pesach. So he came running to the Rebbe, Rabbi Yoli Melech. He tells the Rebbe everything that just happened to him. That Matzavo Kaspir Kasher in his difficult financial situation. Bikesh Lishmoat at Sata Rebbe. Let's see what the Rebbe suggests. Amar Lo Rabbi Rabbi Melech, Lachzor Lishom Reagvul. Go back to the border guard, the guard at the border. Tell him, like Yidlan, Shekorta Kanto, there was a mistake. 
זה אינו חבית של יש, אלא חבית של מים. simply a barrel of water. אבל אם רק לטעום מהחבית כדי להוכיח את זה, open up the barrel and take a sip and you'll see it's only water. והחסיד, שהוא חסיד אמיתי, עשה כעצת הרבה. He did exactly what the Rebbe suggested. חזר לשומרי הבול, he went to the border guards. אמר להם שזו חבית של מים, it's a barrel of water. עליהם רק לטעום, just open up and you taste it. טעמו השומרים, they tasted it. ואכן, היו אלו רק מים, it was only water. And they gave it back to him, fine, okay, מיד החזירו את החבית לחסיד. שמהר להטינה על עגלתו, he quickly put it onto his wagon, ולחזור לרבה רבי מלך. נכנס החסיד לרבה, והתחיל בוכה שנית, בדמות שלי שהוא started crying again. ביטר רטרר, אם יש לזה. הייתה לי חבית של יאש, שאותה אמור הייתי למכור, וברווח לקנות את כל צורכי חג הפסח. I had a barrel of good schnapps, and I would have gotten good money for this. Now what do I have? A barrel of water. I mean, I'm not going to get any money for this. ועכשיו, כשחבית יאש הפכה לחבית מים, נשארתי חסר כל, ולא פרוטה לפרוטה, I can't do anything with it. ומאיך אני אשיג את כל צורכי החג? We may get money for Pesach, provisions. אמר לו הרבה, טעם גם אתה מהמשקה של החבית. Open up the lid and take a sip. טעם החסיד מהמשקה, הוא מצא שאכן הוא יש משובח. It's schnapps all along. וליהודי היה כל צורכי פסח בהרחבה גדולה. And he was able to sell off his uh, produce merchandise somewhere, and he had enough money for Pesach. Again, how exactly Rabbi Melech pulled this off? Um, did, was it psychology here by telling the border guards, you know, it's not whiskey, it's water. You know, when you tell somebody it's water and they take a sip, all right, tastes, they think it's water, so it already tasted like water. Does it mean necessarily that he pulled off some hocus pocus and who knows what and the, constitu- the, 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 the liquid there changed from whiskey to water and then back from water to whiskey? Or was it really a, a psychological test of the mind? I don't know. If you're a thoroughbred chosid, no doubt the water, the whiskey turned water and the water turned whiskey. You take it for what it's worth. But you have to realize these chasidish shamaises are not just a once in a blue moon. These are stories that generated over and over again. If you go back to the first page. And maybe it's going to get my What was that? Maybe it's only a maisa. Maybe it's only a maisa, but you should know that even only a maisa, that means it didn't really happen. There's there's a, a moral lesson. There's a lesson. They're trying to teach us. In the Hasidic maisas, they, they're clearly trying to teach us something about the role of the Rebbe and the possible influence that the Rebbe had on people's lives and how perhaps with Tzadik Gozer, Kadosh Baruch Mekayim, the Rebbe could intervene on some level, and people really believe that. The story of the Besht, Miyabesh Nahar, the Baal Shem Tov, dries up a river. The Felach Bessarabia in Romania, in the area, in the district of Bessarabia in Romania, there was a river that was a regular river that flowed past. There was a Kala from some village before the wedding, Kodem HaChupa, she went there to, to do Tvila, before the Chupa. Vavra Derech Ota Nahar, and she went through that river, Vinitba Hashem Nebuch, she drowned in the river. Nodazot Labal Shem Tov, and the Bal Shem Tov went to that river, Vayelech Ba Bal Shem Tov Ala Nahar, and he issued a decree, Vayegzor Alav, Ki Bishvil Maaseh Zeh, almost a punishment to the river, Yid Yabesh, the river should dry up, Vayasu Mimenu Agam Mayim Katsar, what will remain is just a small little pond, nothing more than that. V'kach v'chein haya, and that's what it was. Char kach, chay p'tirat ha-besh, and after the Baal Shem Tov died, p'am achat nasa derech sham, echad b'bnei ha-Baal Shem Tov. Somebody from the family of the Baal Shem Tov passed by, u'ba'avro derech oto agam, nidrachei v'agam. When he came to this area, somehow the, the pond now became very wide, it became already a deep lake. And was really threatening to drown this person from, who was from the household of the family of the Baal Shem Tov. And the returned from the upper worlds. And the Baal Shem Tov returned to this world, saved him, and, um, and he remained alive. Baal Shem Tov tells this descendant, if I would now know what the air, 
the atmosphere of this world, Olam Azeh, feels like, Lo haya ba le'olam azeh l'atzilo. I never would have come back to rescue you. Ki kashe alav ve'od lizbol ha'avir me'olam azeh. It is so difficult to tolerate the air of this world after having been already in the upper world. Hamaseh shamati me'ish echad she'ya sham etzel oto agam mayim v'sham sepru lo hamaseh azot. I was heard this from somebody who was actually there, as if to say we have to have some testimony. Um, these maiselach happen all the time, all the time. Again, you know, you're skeptic. This can't be, this is ridiculous. There are even some halachic problems with this kind of a story. Very serious halachic problems of Doesha I mean, can, can this really happen? And so on. Can, can people believe after the passing of a tzaddik that the tzaddik is still impacting? Go ask your local Lubavitch Chosid if this can happen. It's not even a joke. Uh, I, we have a, at the Lifshitz College that I teach, we have a secretary who's a staunch Lubavitch Chosid. So um, uh, she had some campaign material before the election for a particular party. So I, I, I try to remind her that in a school, this is forbidden. You're not allowed to do that. You can't campaign for any particular party within the walls of a school in any division of the educational system in this country. And second, I said, and by the way, off the record, I said, you know, why, why is, what is this party? So, because the Rebbe said so. The Rebbe said so, as far as I know, the Rebbe is not, not, not here for almost 20 years already. But that's not an issue. The, the Rebbe said certain things when he was alive, and they are now reconstructed upon the contemporary situation, and therefore it becomes a, a contemporary statement. The Rebbe said so. And this is the way you have to believe in this, uh, for this to happen. But the, don't have about uh, not Hasidish Rebbe. Non-Hasidish Rebbe is, so what, exactly what is a non-Hasidish Rebbe? I can tell you what a non-Hasidish Rebbe is. It's a, it's a Litvish of Rosh Hashiva today. No, I'm not joking. I think what those people who understand who knew what Volozhin was, the Rosh Hashivas of Volozhin and Yeshiva were not Admorim. Never did the uh, Rav Chaim from Volozhin, the Talmud from the Vilna Goyen, Never did the Nitziv of Eloshin or the Rav's great grandfather, Beis Alevi, or Yosef Dober Salavechik, expect that Talmidim would come to them for Aetis and, 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 and wouldn't make decisions. The Rav once told me that it was very easy to be a Chosset, very difficult to be a Misnagid, because if you're a Chosset, you make one basic decision in life to be a Chosset of the Rebbe. After that, it's easy rider, because the Rebbe is going to make the fundamental, critical decisions for you in life. But if you're a Misnagid, every time you wake up in the morning, you have to make a decision how to get dressed. And, the, and you have to make many, many decisions. A chosid makes less decisions. You have to listen to the Well, that's, that's very much not easy. If you've read um, Esther Farbstein's very, very, very important book, let's call it very important uh, scholarly work on the Shoah, uh, dealing with, I would say, the most sensitive religious questions that we have to deal with, it has a lot to do with how the uh, certain Admorim, not all, certain Admorim, basically gave guidance to the Chassidim to stay put in Poland, and they perished, and some of these Admorim ended up getting out at the end. These are difficult questions. Difficult questions. Now, if you're really a staunch Chassid, uh, you will say, like whether you're the Belzer Chassid or a Gera Chassid, you will say that the Rebbe had no other recourse but to survive in order to guarantee the survival of the Hasidic movement. Because the truth of the matter is, the, uh, as, as we exited the Shoah, the Bells of Hasidus was, as they say in this country, I mean, it was almost obliterated. Almost obliterated. Nine people. Almost obliterated. And you take today, the Bells and Gur, they really dominate the scenes. And it has a lot to do with the fact that both Rebbes ultimately survived. So, again, I'm not here to pass judgment on Rebbes. These are very difficult questions, whether it was the Sapa Rebbe or others. These were difficult questions that Esther Farbstein uh, indeed tries to uh, deal with. Um, the same chaver of mine, Rav Yoni Berlin, told me the following story. Here in Israel, there was a, uh, a non-religious couple who were having fertility issues and having dealt with it, however they dealt with it, somebody suggested that they go to, for a brocha to some kubel in Yerushalayim, some Kabbalists. And they really weren't the type of people to engage a mukubal, but you know, if you're desperate, so you're willing to get a bracha from a mukubal. They met up with some a kabbalist. They met up with some uh, uh, mitavech, somebody an intermediary who would bring their request to the mukubal. 
And what came back was, indeed, um, the Reb, the, the Makubal, was willing to give them a bracha that they'll have a son, but with one condition. They must call the son uh, the name Elimelech, because the schut, that they're going to have a child, is a little taking into the overdraft of the schuyot of Rabbi of, of, of Elimelech from Lijansk. So if they call the baby Elimelech, if they agree to these terms, they'll have a baby. Yofi, they agree, you know, when you're desperate, you're desperate. So fine, the baby, the mother, the, the wife uh, is expecting, and she has a healthy born boy, and they decide, the mother decides, Elimelech is not exactly a modern Israeli name, <laughs> so they decided to give another name. The Metavech bumps into the husband one day, this intermediary, and he says, well, no, what's new? No? We had a boy, we had a boy, Yofi. So the Metavech says, and you called him Elimelech? No, 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 no. You see, the, the, my wife really didn't think this was a good name because uh, you know, it's not an Israeli name. So what did you call him? We called him Noam. Oh. The Noam Elimelech. <laughs> without knowing, without knowing, <laughs> they called him Noam. Yeah, 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 yeah. You never know. You never know how these things work. Sure, 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 sure. Before we get to the, uh, the, the very most interesting story from Emel from Lijansk, so I just want to um, just share some of the, uh, the melodies of Gur and Chabad that we're familiar with. We're familiar, we just don't know sometimes that they're Gur and Chabad. No, this is Ger. The one who recorded this was, remember who? No, 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 no. Verdiger. David Verdiger. We know the son more today, the Mordechai Ben David, but Ben David is David Verdiger. Yeah, a long time ago. Long time ago. Yafe? Yafe? This is the good one from David Verdiger. Um, but this is authentic Gerenigan that today sung, as you know, all over, literally all over. I want to just share with you this um, this first Maisala on the first page where it says, Asipur Rebeli Melech Vikarata Marak. So there's several stories about bowls of soup. 
all kinds of bowls of soup stories. One bowl of soup story is a Balatanya story. The Rav Shnez Liadi was invited guest in some community, and before Shabbat, the entire family wanted to um, take part in the Shabbos preparations. Nobody wanted to be left out. And indeed, uh, there was a lot to be done, to prepare the house, to prepare the food. So they had a family meeting on Thursday. They gave out all the various tasks. Fine, everything was set. Everybody goes about doing what they had to do to prepare the house and the food and the kitchen for Shabbat. In the middle of the night, somebody wakes up, a member of the family, remembers there's one task that was forgotten, to put salt and spices in the soup. So instead of waking everybody up and convening another family meeting, person just goes quietly to the kitchen, a bizzle zout, a bizzle bethem, goes back to sleep. Half hour later, somebody else wakes up and says, boy, we forgot to give out the task of putting in some spices and salt in the soup. So why wake up? Everybody gets up, puts salt, puts pepper, and this goes on eight times over throughout the night. Ken sich vorstellen what the soup tastes like on Friday night. They end up, they serve the soup, and it's, it's fuya. I mean, nobody can touch it. And the Rebbe is eating and eating and eating, and they're embarrassed. And they can't understand, how can you, it's inedible. I mean, how can you eat this? And they asked the Rebbe, don't you, can't you taste it? That it's, it's uh, they're apologizing, something went wrong here, something spoiled, uh, they don't even know what happened. And the Rebbe says, he has accustomed himself many, many years ago to completely void his sense of taste, that the only reason that he eats is to be strong for Avodat Hashem. The only reason. Although he said it's quite permissible to enjoy the food, he felt that by enjoying the food, so while of course he's eating so he can be strong for Avodat Hashem, the enjoyment of the food takes away a little bit of a sliver of the Avodat Hashem. And therefore he trained himself that he doesn't taste any of the food. Therefore it made not a bit of a difference to him whether it had salt or was too much salt or too much pepper and so on. That's one soup story. Another soup story happened to the Rob's grandfather Reb Chaim from Brisk. This is not a Chassidah Shemaisa. It's a thoroughbred lit for Shemaisa. Reb Chaim's mind was working all the time about resolving difficulties in the Rambam and in the Halakha and the Gemara and so on. So they say he was once eating a bowl of soup and he could not focus and the soup went right into his beard. I mean, a, he could not focus that, that, that where, where the spoon goes, because his cough. He was thinking, 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 thinking. The next thing you know, half the soup was running down his beard. This is a story from Reb Chaim. Yeah. And, he, and, he, and they asked him what happened. He says, uh, his cup, his cup was in the Rambam. You know, it wasn't in the cup of soup. The, uh, but this is a story of a, a powerful story, that there is a, uh, a woman who wrote a doctorate at Bar Ilan University, a Dr. Dina Cohen, who I do not know, but she wrote a doctorate on Hasidish Amaisis. Now, the truth of the matter is, when you subject Sipurei Hasidim to academic uh, dissection, you're really taking the neshama out. <laughs> That's what you're doing with it. So I'm not gonna do that now, but just make some points, I think very, very interesting points. Let's read the story first, and then we'll make some comments. The first story of Rabbi Melech and the bowl of soup, the Karat Hamarak. It's from the Sefer Oel Alimelech, which is the uh, Sefer of stories of Rabbi Melech from Lijansk. And there are two uh, players here. One is Rabbi Melech, and the other is Rabbi Menachem Mendel from Rimenov. Now, in some of my groups of Poland, we've gone down south, in southeast Poland, to the Rimenov. Uh, today it's a town that uh, has no Jews left. There was a, a shul, a remnant of a shul, that was a churva, literally a churva, the roof was already the, not there any longer. Was, the building, the walls were up, the roof was not there. Grass was growing inside, uh, very high. Nobody tended to the, to the grass. The windows were banged out, and uh, there was no real entrance to talk about. I had to slide through. And really, it said everything you wanted to say about what happened to a Polish Jewry. It was just completely obliterated. Yet in uh, Brooklyn, New York, in Flatbush, there's a Chassidish Rebbe who stems from the remnant of a dynasty, and he decided that he's going to raise some money and fix it up a little bit. That's a, that's a question. I'm not even going to get into this, whether this is good for the Jews or not. There are certain places where the Chassidim and Chutzlaret invested money to fix up these churvas, 
and make them into a shul, even though nobody davens there. But when the groups come, at least they should see epis, something of what it looked like. For example, in Boba, the shul was rebuilt and reconstructed. So this fellow, this Rav in the uh, Rebbe in, Bar in Flatbush, engages in, in the re rehabilitating the shul. Now, uh, I came across this the second time that I visited Rimenov. I saw it in the process of its rehabilitation. And uh, the reason why I went there was when I was um, rabbinating by remote control to a community in Zurich. That's a concept. I sat in Yerushalayim, and by remote control, I had a gila in Zurich. So I got to know a very, very nice family who was planning to make a bar mitzvah for one of their grandchildren. They themselves, the grandchild himself, was a direct descendant from the Rimen of a Rebbe. The Rimen of a Rebbe yard site was the day after Lagboimer, the 19th of the year. And this boy's bar mitzvah day was the 19th of the year. So the grandfather, a Bob Hashem well-to-do person, decided he's going to make the bar mitzvah in the Rimen of a Shul. And he asked me what it looks like. I said, listen, it's a churva, but they're rehabilitating it. So I went back for another trip. And we went to Rimenov, and I reported to this gentleman in uh, Zurich where it's holding, and they were making some progress, and there was a fighting chance by this boy's bar mitzvah, it's going to be a, a, a possible to make a bar mitzvah there. But when I went to visit, the workers there, the Polish workers thought that I was representing that Rebbe from Flatbush. So they treated me like a king. They, they, they gave me this grand tour, and I said, oh, this looks nice, this looks nice. Everything's nice, everything's nice. The meal had nothing to do with it. And I went back to Zurich and explained to them that, yes, I think in a year's time. And indeed, it's, it's, the field building's not finished yet, but it's very much livable. And they had a, a very interesting bar mitzvah there at the Rimen of a shul. So before I even get to this story, Something happened in that shul in Rimenov. The Rebbe himself was the Shlich Tzibur for Yom Neroyim. And he got to the poem, the Piyut, of Lekeil Oruchtin. We all know the Lekeil Oruchtin. It follows the Aleph Bet, the Bochin, the Vavod, the Gole Amukot, and so on. It follows the Aleph Bet, you can remember by heart. So one of the lines is Lekone Avadav Badin. Right? So we, we passionately, yeah, the, the Nusach that we use, the uh, right? So here I've got a letter I in the the letter Kuf, the Kone Avadav, the Kone Avadav Badin. So the Rebbe is davening, and they get to the Mekel Din, and when he gets up to the Kone Avadav Badin, the Kedosh he, he, he acquires his slaves, Badin, in judgment. What does this mean? The Rebbe stops dead in his track. The Rimenevah, Rabbi Menachem Mendel from Rimenev, who was also a Talmud from the, from the Magad of Mezuch, but he's a younger contemporary of Rabbi Limelech from Lizhansk. And he's going to feature in the story we're going to read. So the Rebbe stops dead in his tracks, and all the chassidim are standing there. This is the middle of Chazar Tashatz. And they're standing. And the Oren Kodesh is open. And he's standing there. Five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes. A half an hour passes. Forty minutes, forty-five minutes. Almost an hour passes. And the Rebbe goes, What was this interruption? He just stood there. He did nothing. Well, at least it seemed that he did nothing. After davening, obviously the Rebbe was approached. He had to explain what, what exactly happened. The Rebbe said he went into a trance. He went into a trance that his neshama started floating up, 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 and he saw the Satan with a wheelbarrow of the Averot of Am Yisrael. And it was a terrible sight. The wheelbarrow was full and overflowing with Averot. So the neshama of the Rebbe of, uh, tells the Satan, Will you bring these uh, bears? Oh, it's, it's Rosh Hashanah. We'll bring it to uh, the Rabbi Nisham for, for Din, for Mishpat. So the remnant of his Neshama tells the son, you know, a few kilometers back, there were three or four Averis that fell off the wheelbarrow. You know what? I'll watch the wheelbarrow for you. You go back and fetch those three lost Nisham Averis. And, and, and so, fine, great deal. The son goes back and running, running back for his Averis. And, and meanwhile, the remnant of his neshama takes the wheelbarrow, throws all the Averis off a cliff, and the wheelbarrow is empty. The uh, Sultan comes back. <laughs> what happened to all my Averis? He has his three Averis that he caught up with. And that's it, but the wheelbarrow is empty. So he said, 
they got lost, they got stolen, whatever. So something summons the Nisham of the Rimeneva to the high court, to the Beit and Shalvayla, to the Rabbi Yisham, for a Mishpat. I mean, you're a Ganav. What's going on here? So Rabbi Yisham asked the Rimeneva's Nishama, you know, what happened? He says, well, I stole them, and they're not here. All right, you stole them. Pay up. <laughs> you have to pay up. <laughs> you're a Ganav, you have to pay. Rimeneva says, I have nothing. So what does the Chumash say? That if the Ganav has nothing to repay, you sell him as a slave. And he'll work those years and pay off what he owes to the, to the person who was stolen from, the victim. So the Kadosh Baruch Hu puts out a tender, a mikraz, who wants to buy the Rimeneva as a Evid. Any takers here? And there are no takers. None of the Malachim are interested in the Neshama of the Rimeneva as an Evid. So Kadosh Baruch Hu says, I will buy him as my effort. And that's what it means. It took about an hour for this whole story to play itself out. And that's what it meant. These stories, first of all, this story could have happened, by the way. This is not one of these stories that Efshar made. This story really could have happened, and it was in that shul that we visit. That we know for sure. It speaks of the tremendous amount of Mesirot Nefesh that the Rebbe's had for the Fakla Yisrael. Tremendous. They're willing to be much Nefesh themselves for the people. And, and, and embedded in that story is really that message. So you have now Rabbi Lamela from Lijans and the young Rabbi Nachem Mendel from Remenov. He's still one of the Chevra. He's still one of the Chesida. The story goes, Biotom Mistofev Betzel Kvot Kotcho He was still under the wings of his Rebbe the Kadosh from the Melech Zatzal, Zevet Zadik Bracha, the Terem Nodal, the Ishmofet, he was not yet known as a Baal Moishes himself, U Baal Ruach HaKodesh, Vayam Kechad Melech HaSidin, the Hayoshvim, the Fnei Rabam, he was just this Menachem Mendel from Rimenov, which just one of the fellas, Kara Adabad, the following happened. This is how Rabbi Menachem Mendel is being introduced to us in this story. One of the fellas, that's all. The Yom HaShabbat, the Sudash Niyan, the Shabbos meal, the morning meal, they were all sitting together around the Shabbos table, Shabbos meal table, with their Rebbe, Rav Reli Melech. When the, the, the one who served, served the bowl of soup before the Rebbe, Rav Reli Melech, just turned the plate, the bowl, upside down, had everything spill out. Everything spilled. Vayitzak Moreno Rabenu Moreno Arav Rabbenacha Mendel Betov Behalav Pachat and Rabbenacha Mendel from Rimenov yelled out, Ay, Adoni Moriva Rabbi, Halo Yiku Otanu Kulanu Masad, they're going to arrest us for this. Vatahanicham, he said, Leave it, let's get out of here. So the people, the other people around the table, they thought he was crazy. Well, why should anybody arrest Rabbi Melech? for spilling soup. Why exactly did he spill the soup? The others around the table, and they heard this yelling of the Rimeneva. They almost broke out in laughter. Ephes, however, because of the awe that they had for their Rebbe, they, 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 they held their mouths together. They didn't break out in any laughter because you can't. So it wouldn't be proper respect. Moreover, Rabo HaKadosh HaShivlo, Rabbi Melech decides to explain to all of them what just happened. Bini, shalom lano, al tira, halo anachnu po hayom kulano. We're all here. What do you mean we're all here? But for a moment we weren't here. Chakach siper rabam ba'atzmo masha v'abinehem. They explained. Echad misarei ha-memshala, one of the government of uh, ministers, mezimat, mezimot, ya'ad, uh, had a plan to do evil to all the Jews in the country. And actually put it in a document, all the venom in the document, and all he needed now was the royal seal to make it active. This minister didn't succeed in getting the royal stamp to put on it. Why? Every time it was ready, something happened. The document wasn't ready. 
to properly put it on the table of the king. Ah, finally, this letter that will, that speaks of the of, of the hatred for the Jews and what they're going to do to them. The letter was ready. Nothing could come up, nothing could come up, anything that would prevent uh, this letter from going now to the king for final stamping. The way people would write, they had the ink, and then they would sprinkle some sand on it so that the ink should dry quickly. At that moment, Rabbi Melech said, at that moment, I took the bowl of soup and I turned it upside down as a gesture. That that minister, as he's pouring the sand, something should happen as well. What happened? That minister made a mistake. In, in the place of the the the, the uh, uh, the, the, the sand, the, the barrel of sand, he took the barrel of ink, and instead of drying the ink, he ended up smudging, smudging the whole thing, he poured on ink, and of course it ruined the whole thing. The, 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 uh, the calls the rimen of who's known as Avreich in the Chomish? Yosef, Yosef, right? There's something that he's, he's he's pointing now to the others that there is a special appointment, just like Yaakov Vino appoints Yosef. So Rabbi Melech, in a sense, is appointing Rabbi Menachem Mendel to be the successor here. Who he saw everything that was going on. Not only my I, did I see it because I was a participant. I was the one who turned the the bowl of the soup over because it was a gesture to force that minister to turn over the wrong barrel and he turned over the ink. But Rabbi Menachem Mendel saw the whole thing. And not only did he see it, he, Rabbi Menachem Mendel lost it. Where was he? He was there. He was there. And he thought that the one who poured the ink over the document wasn't the minister, but was Rabbi Menachem from the Jans himself. And therefore he screamed out, they're going to arrest you for this. How can you do this? Where in fact, of course, Rabbi Melech wasn't there at all, but uh, this was all to point out that this Avrech, Tzofeh Baruch HaKodesh, that the Rabbi Nacha Mendel from, from Rimenov was uh, blessed with that measure of Ruach HaKodesh, that he was able to tune in to this whole story. The truth of the matter is, um, when, you, when you hear it just as a story, and you realize that this kind of a Maisala is not only talking about the uh, Shevach of Rabbi Melech from Lijans, but, he's, but it's talking about succession. It's talking about something of the relationship between one generation of the Admorim and the next generation. This Dr. Dina Cohen has 10 pages that I Xeroxed from the internet about an analysis of this. And I was discussing this with my wife before, and she said, you know, when you take a great Hasid Shamaisa, you subject it to academic analysis, it just loses touch. And I wouldn't dare even make that presentation here. But I think she makes some valid points about that this is not just a gemachta story, a made-up story, that this kind of story is a story with a message, uh, no doubt. And um, indeed, Rabbi Levela from Lijans had enormous, enormous impact on the, 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 the development of Hasidut on Polish soil, because he's the first to come to uh, Poland in the town of Lijansk, and from there, it moves to the next generation, who is the Choyzer from Lublin, and Lublin is not just a little city. Lublin is a capital of Poland at the time. And when Hasidut makes it to Poland, uh, Hasidut really, when it makes it to Lublin, Hasidut has really made it, has come home, has matured. And um, in Lublin, there was no small fighting between uh, uh, the Hasidim and the Misnagdim, uh, but ultimately, but ultimately, the Hasidic world uh, prevailed. There were the, the Misnagdim world in Lublin said that when the Choyzer from Lublin will die, they're going to make a kiddush. I mean, that's how the, 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 the schism between Hasidim and Snagdim are. said they're going to make a kiddush, and they're going to eat and drink and be merry. And the Chayza said, the day that I die, nobody's going to eat and nobody's going to drink. What happened was, it was, it was Simchus Taira, Simchus Taira, and the Chayza fell out of the window. The Hasidim calls, called this the Nefilah. 
And the filah doesn't just mean the fall. Something happened in a ruhani way that he fell. And uh, while he survives the fall, but he never really survives. He lives for another three quarters of a year in a very, very difficult situation, and he dies on Tisha B'Av. The day that he dies, nobody eats and nobody drinks. And this is a, like almost a parting uh, line of the Choyz of Lublin, who was a Talmud Mufark of the uh, Rabbi Melech from uh, uh, Lijans. All right, we're just going to end with uh, some more uh, uh, Hasidut uh, songs, Hasidish songs that uh, we know. Um, there's a particular nigan from Chabad that's very, very moving. We all know it, but it's really, a, as I say, a neshama dika nigan. <laughs> from Rabbi Aaron Mikarlin, Yayach Sof. How many of you sing it on Friday night?
The singer Yitzhak Meir tells the story in the name of uh, the Magid from Ezrich, Rabbi Aaron Mikarlin was a Talmud there as well, that they heard Bat Kol Minashamayim, that they were so in love with the Nigunim, and the way Rabbi Aaron Mikarlin sang Shira Shiram on Friday night, that the Malachim stopped saying Shira Takadosh Baruch Hu momentarily to tune in to the Nigunim of Rabbi Aaron Mikarlin, that came a request that he should compose a nigun for Kedushat Shabbat. And this is where the Koyach uh, Sof came into play. You have to be a chassid to go along with these stories here. <laughs> so it's, uh, but it's just an absolutely beautiful nigun. Absolutely beautiful. It took me a long time to learn it, by the way. It came through my kids and my sons-in-law, and they brought it to the table. But it's, uh, it's really a beautiful nigun. You know, at the time, is uh, looking at the watch here, and we're just going to um, wrap it up with... Um, I don't know if you're up to share on Malas yet, but uh, I like we'd like to sing Imash Kechech Yerushalayim from uh, Shloimala and then move into Shir Amala, so we can do this if you want. I don't know if you, uh, I'm sure there's some more announcements. You want? Yeah? What? You ready for Shir Amala anyway? Are there going to be more announcements? Because you want know, to make the announcements and I'm going to lead into Shir Amala, okay? Please. Oh, you want to do the raffle first before benching? We, we want to do a raffle. Can we just do the raffle? Sure. People. Has everybody got the, you know, raffle ticket? Oh, uh, Here. We've got three raffles, so I can speak loudly. Okay. Can I get a, bo a box, please? Rabbi uh, Adler, can I ask you to draw a raffle, please? Uh, if I can just get them. Oh, it's here. Yeah. Uh, that's for the first prize, which is a voucher to the Tikra house. Rabbi Adler, please. One. One to start off. You can read that. I haven't got my glasses on. Thirteen? Thirteen. Oh, very good. Very good. Uh, oh. uh, the second prize is a beautiful bowl of fruit made up and donated by Delia. 
Six, oh. Who's, uh, it's a blue one. Sixty. Otherwise, the red one Somebody must have bought it. We're not up to sixty. Could you turn it? Oh, it's nine. It's nine. It's nine. It's nine. Who's got nine? <laughs> Has anyone got nine? Nine blue? Oh well, because in the meantime, everybody check your, you know, please. Now, the third... Oh, it's the uh, basket of basket of fruit. Please draw it again. Oh. <laughs> Red, 72. 72. 72. You? Oh, oh, good. Jackie's birthday. Lovely. What about one? You've won a basket of fruit. Oh, nice, thank yes. you. With a bottle of wine. Thank you very much. All right, uh, now the third prize, I must tell you, it's something very, very special. It's a picture drawn by a member of our group called Leslie Hamilton. Leslie, unfortunately, passed away about a month ago, and her daughter donated the painting for us to wrestle. So... Sandringham, I think. Sandringham? Sandringham? Sandringham, I think. 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 Sandringham, I come from a Hasidic family, and I certainly enjoyed all the stories, and I know that they're true. So it was beautiful. Please. Yes. Please. Thank you. 